Information discussed in this podcast may be sensitive in nature to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Lisa Lynn Stone had a lot of tragedy in her life, but in 2010, she was 51 years old and doing her best to live life to the fullest. Friends describe her as funny, outgoing, bubbly, and love to laugh and make others laugh. In 2010, she was also living with her partner of 15 years, Sherry Henry. And Sherry would tell a little bit different story of Lisa, a story of struggling with depression and some drug use. But Sherry says that she loved Lisa and she believed that Lisa loved her. As an adult, Lisa would reconnect with some of her former high school friends. They would stay in touch regularly after that, often chatting on social media and sharing photos and texting. A neighbor of Lisa's remembered seeing her on June 4th, 2010, but after several days went by with no sign of Lisa, they became worried. This was not like her at all. Her friends also noticed that her daily social media posting had abruptly stopped also on June 4th. By June 20th, they had officially reported her missing. Sherry, Lisa's longtime partner, said she didn't think anything was wrong and that Lisa had probably just taken off. No one besides Sherry believed that, however, and Lisa hasn't been seen or heard from since. Where is Lisa Lynn Stone? Hello, and welcome back to the Where Are They podcast. If you are new here, I so appreciate you listening to these cases. We try to tell the stories of some of the lesser known unsolved missing person cases out there. And with the thousands, tens of thousands active every day in the US and Canada alone, there are no shortage of stories to tell. And it still baffles me Every day, how can so many people just disappear? Today's case, the story of Lisa Lynn Stone, is our third episode in our Pride Month series. Lisa's story was featured on 48 Hours several years ago, so her case received a little more media attention than our previous two cases that we recently covered. And most of that was due to the determination and tenacity of her three friends who have worked to keep her case in the media spotlight, at least to some degree. Although, to this day, 12 years after her disappearance, we still have no answers as to the whereabouts of Lisa Stone. So let's get into the story of Lisa Lynn Stone. Lisa was born in the Dallas, Texas area on September 3rd, 1958. She had two brothers and one sister and overall a pretty close-knit family. 
Her dad was a police officer and her mother was a stay-at-home mom. In high school, Lisa was beautiful, bubbly, and fun, participating on the drill team, which of course during that time in Texas was a pretty big deal. She was very likable and had a lot of friends. Lisa would go on to graduate from Mesquite High School. Mesquite is an eastern suburb of Dallas, Texas. She did suffer some sadness in her life, however, when she lost her sister to a car accident. And then her brother died from AIDS. In the 1990s, Lisa, who, like her brother, had come out as gay, went out for the night to a club. It was there she met Sherry. Sherry describes their relationship as happening almost immediately. They would become more serious throughout the years. And in 2005, after Lisa's father passed away, Sherry moved in. Take a listen to what Sherry had to say about Lisa on her 48 Hours interview. My name is Sherry Henry, and Lisa is my partner of 15 plus years. When I first met Lisa, I walked into the club. She was across the the way, and our eyes met. She came over and started chatting with me, and we hit it off. Were you a couple almost immediately? Almost immediately. Were you in love with her? Very much. And was she in love with you? I would hope. (laughs) Did you consider yourselves married? Yes. Earlier, Lisa had lost her mother to cancer, and she would live with her dad, who was a retired police officer, until he passed away in 2005, at which time Sherry would move in. Around the same time in life, Lisa lost her job in newspaper ad sales. Sherry claimed that all of that happening would be a turning point for Lisa. Lisa had inherited a sizable amount of money from her family, almost $300,000. Although it's unclear exactly what happened to it, most of that money would be gone by 2010. Some say that Sherry had actually spent it all, while Sherry claims that it was Lisa. Lisa had kept in close contact with her friend group from high school after reuniting with them at a class reunion. These women were her former drill team teammates. And they talked and texted regularly. Most of them were very active by now on Facebook, and they used that as a way to keep in touch as well. Lisa's friends knew she had some struggles. I mean, this woman had been through a lot, losing many family members, some in tragic and sad ways. Leading up to 2010, they also knew that Lisa had begun to have some financial struggles. In fact, at one point when she told them she was broke, they loaned her some money. In early 2010, one of those friends went to lunch with Lisa. This friend says that Lisa had expressed to her that her relationship with Sherry wasn't going great. And her friend actually urged her to leave. But Lisa wouldn't listen. So at this time in 2010, Lisa and Sherry were living in a home owned by Lisa, a home that Lisa had inherited from her family in Dallas, Texas. Lisa posted daily on Facebook, so most of her friends knew her struggles as she was very open about it in her posts. But no one knows exactly what was going on behind closed doors in their home. Well, no one except Lisa and Sherry. But two very different stories of Lisa would soon emerge. The Disappearance On June 4th, 2010, a neighbor had a chat with Lisa. Lisa was going to be taking her trash out for her the next day, and the neighbor wanted to confirm that Lisa would be able to do that. Lisa, of course, said absolutely. When they parted ways, Lisa told her she'd see her tomorrow. And it seems like Lisa and this neighbor were pretty close, Lisa often helping the neighbor out with these daily type of chores. And in fact, Lisa would also be picking up her neighbor's daughter at the airport in just a couple of weeks. But on June 5th, 2010, the very next day, the neighbor gets a call from Sherry. Now, it says she was always pretty close with Lisa, but never Sherry. 
And prior to that day, Sherry had never reached out to her for any real reason. But this day, Sherry called with some distressing news. Sherry said that Lisa had to have emergency gallbladder surgery and wouldn't be able to help her get the trash out. So instead, Sherry was going to help her. The neighbor, of course, was worried for her friend, for Lisa, but thought that it was nice of Sherry to come over and help her and just overall hoped that everything would be okay with Lisa and her surgery. But a few days would go by and no one now had heard from Lisa. Her friends started checking in with one another to see if they had heard from her, if anyone had heard from her, but no one had. They also thought it was strange that Lisa hadn't posted on Facebook at all. And Lisa was someone who posted every single day without fail. So one of her friends, not being able to reach Lisa, finally calls Sherry and asks where Lisa is. But Sherry just said that she had left town for a while. Sherry wasn't worried or concerned at all. Still, her friends didn't think that sounded right, and they still tried desperately to get in touch with Lisa. And as days went by, and eventually weeks, they start zeroing in on Sherry. And Sherry, according to the friends, started giving them different stories as to where Lisa was. But still said she wasn't worried at all, and that Lisa wasn't missing, she had just simply left. One of the friends said that a few of them went over one evening to talk with Sherry and try and get some answers. They said that Sherry invited them in the house and told them that Lisa was expected home that night and she was going to order pizza for dinner. She said the friends could stay and wait if they wanted, which they did. For an hour and a half, but still no Lisa. Sherry, however, says that that story is a complete lie, that no one ever came into her house at all, there was no talk of ordering pizza or Lisa coming home that night, that none of that ever happened. On June 20th, the neighbor finally makes a missing persons report on Lisa Stone. Law enforcement came out and took the call and spoke to Sherry as well, but within five days, they closed the case, believing that Lisa just likely took off on her own. There was no signs of foul play or a crime being committed. And Sherry, her partner, her roommate, her friend, said there was nothing to worry about that Lisa had just left. On June 29th, the police get a call asking them to do a welfare check on Lisa. When they arrived at the home that day, Sherry told this officer that Lisa was away at a funeral. Lisa's friends decided they needed to start investigating for themselves to find their friend. Law enforcement wasn't taking it seriously, but they knew in their hearts that something was very, very wrong. A few days later, on July 2nd, one of the friends decided to drive over to Sherry and Lisa's house one evening and confront Sherry, make Sherry talk to her. But en route, she happened to see Sherry driving Lisa's car while sitting at a red light, and she decided to follow her. Sherry would drive just down the street to a nearby 7-Eleven convenience store and pulled up to the dumpster area. The friend parked at a gas pump and tried to watch her discreetly. She says that she saw Sherry toss in what looked like some baskets and a small suitcase. And after Sherry drove away, the friend went to the dumpster and pulled the suitcase out, and what she found inside made her heart stop. In that small suitcase was Lisa's birth certificate, some paperwork belonging to Lisa, and a whole bunch of personal photographs, even Lisa's brother's death certificate, all being thrown in the trash. The friends decided to take this information to law enforcement and demand answers. Meanwhile, Susan, Lisa and Sherry's neighbor, also began to have her suspicions, too. She recalled some odd things happening around the time Lisa vanished. Of course, the first being that strange story about Lisa's gallbladder surgery. Susan says that she also went inside their home at one point and said that the house itself was pretty messy, but the bathroom was spotless and very thoroughly cleaned from top to bottom. She also noticed that Sherry's hands were red and raw, perhaps from using intense cleaning products 
such as bleach. As the neighbor and the friends voiced their opinions, Sherry would get defensive. She would claim that she is the victim of a witch hunt and that these stories are of things that never happened, that are completely 100% made up. After the friends had marched into the offices of law enforcement in Dallas, Texas, however, the authorities agreed that their findings were indeed suspicious and they would reopen the case. The search. The search for Lisa would take some twists and turns along the way, quite a bit, actually, just like the process of reporting her missing was. First, authorities do go to the home of Sherry and Lisa to question Sherry. They specifically ask her why she never reported Lisa missing herself, and Sherry replied that Well, she just simply doesn't think Lisa is missing. She thinks Lisa left on her own accord. But investigators point out that Lisa left behind her car and her purse. And they also mention the suitcase full of items that she was seen throwing away. But again, Sherry said that that story was completely false. Totally made up. She believed that the friends might have broken and stole the items out of her house. She would also say that What a lot of people didn't know about Lisa was that she had been struggling really bad. She had run out of money, she was severely depressed, and according to Sherry, she had recently started doing cocaine. Her friends can believe the running out of money part. After all, Lisa had told them that herself, and they could also believe that she was depressed. That was also something that Lisa had been open with them about. Lisa was an open book, especially on her Facebook page. But cocaine? That just didn't make any sense to them. But unfortunately, the search at the home turned up no evidence of where Lisa might have gone. But what is interesting is that after they did visit the home, authorities called Animal Control, who would end up removing 26 cats and two dogs from the home, citing unsanitary conditions. Although reports on the actual number of cats removed does vary, all of the reports have that number in the 20s. Sherry said those pets were Lisa's. Lisa's friends, again, say that Lisa was a huge, huge animal lover. Her pets are what got her through the day on most occasions. They don't believe she would have ever left them. Another strange incident would come up shortly after the home search when Sherry was spotted running back by a creek behind their house in a wooded area. She was completely disheveled looking, she was covered in mud, and she was on the run. Later, when questioned by authorities if that was her, she admitted that it was. So everyone immediately wondered, what was she up to back by that creek? Why was she acting like that? And why was she covered in mud? They would end up searching that entire wooded area in the creek. And Sherry said that she was running because she feared for her life. She said she had seen people going up near her house. And at one point, she even thought that there were some women chasing her, which is why she was running. She also says that at one point, while hiding behind a tree or some structure to look at her house, She thought she saw the blinds move, and she believed that someone was actually inside of her house. So she got scared and took off. Sherry said that she knew people blamed her for Lisa's disappearance, and she felt these people were after her. In July, police received a tip that took them to Hunt County, Texas, where they searched a grassy area, just a small one-square-mile search area. And that search, however, didn't turn up any clues or leads. And it was never really revealed what tip led them there in the first place. So let's take a look at the area in which all of this is happening. Lisa had inherited the home at 3323 Truxillo Drive in Dallas. This is a populated neighborhood area. But the interesting thing about her home in particular was the extra tall privacy fence that surrounded the home, keeping everything behind it completely out of view. 
The area of Truxillo Drive, this neighborhood, is nearby two lakes. White Rock Lake is four miles to the west of the home, and Lake Ray Hubbard, a larger lake, sits eight miles to the east. And of course, the surrounding areas near those lakes shows a lot of parkland and woods as well. The area they searched in Hunt County, Texas, specifically was in the town of Greenville, about 45 miles from the home on Truxillo. They never did elaborate as to what had led them to search that area, and nothing of any consequence, of course, was found. Meanwhile, Sherry maintains her innocence and claims that Lisa was struggling more than people know, both with her mental health and her drug use. Sherry thinks that she has been the victim, a victim of a witch hunt on her, and has spoken out to her innocence. But Sherry says there's nothing to piece together. Did you file a missing persons report? No, I did not. Was there ever a time when you thought, as her life partner, that you should file a missing persons report? No, at the time, prior to me leaving Dallas, Lisa Stone is not missing. I was surrounded by at least 10 or 15 women in their SUVs and cars trying to track me down. And I felt like I was a rabbit being chased for the hunt. I come home. When I come around the back alley and go through the gate, I see the blinds part. Inside your house? Inside the house. So I get a little freaked. I'm thinking somebody's in the house. Now you tell me, you wouldn't be scared for that? I'm afraid. I went around through the woods off of that creek area. You will not tear down my life. You will not point the finger at me until you have verifiable proof that I have ever done anything other than support Lisa Stone and whatever she wanted to accomplish in her life. Lisa and I love each other. End of discussion. Law enforcement has said that Sherry is a person of interest. In fact, she is their main person of interest. But to date, no evidence has been found to link Sherry to doing anything to Lisa. It seems that the authorities have acknowledged that something is very wrong in Lisa's disappearance. But friends and those involved in the case believe that they haven't taken them as seriously as they should have, especially from the beginning. Her friends have even said that they themselves have done far more investigating than law enforcement. And in fact, Sherry has filed complaints against these friends for stalking her and harassing her, in which authorities have had to warn the friends to back off. Another interesting fact about Sherry is that in 1995, she was convicted of fraud and forgery for, get this, forging a check from Lisa's father's account for $8,000. But Sherry does admit that she did do that. She claims that she has changed her ways after that and owned up to her mistakes. Lisa's friends still refuse to believe that their vivacious, full-of-life friend left on her own. What do you think happened to Lisa Lynn Stone? Lisa is described as a Caucasian woman standing 5 foot 6 inches tall, with dyed blonde hair when she was last seen in June of 2010. At that time, she weighed around 130 pounds. Lisa was 51 years old and would today be 63. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Lisa Lynn Stone, please contact the Dallas Police Department at 214-671-4316. Thank you so much for listening to Lisa's story today, our third episode in honor of Pride Month this June. This June also marks the 12th anniversary of Lisa's disappearance, and it doesn't seem that authorities are much further to solving this case. Please remember to give us a follow over on social media. In the event of any case updates, we will post first over there on those channels. If you'd like to support the show, Well, please consider joining us over on Patreon. The next series of bonus episodes going up over there will be the Lost in the Ozarks series, focusing on missing persons from the Ozark region of the U.S. 
Thank you again for listening to Lisa's story. Please share her case, share her name, keep her story out there. Someone might just know something. We will be back again next week with another unsolved missing persons case. And until then, stay safe and hug your loved ones.